Good morning, everybody. I understand it's in English. Um, it is uh, my great pleasure to open the uh, inauguration ceremony uh, of the Google AI for Social Good Initiative at Tel Aviv University. This initiative is aimed at fostering interdisciplinary research, AI research for the benefit of society. Um, I would like to invite uh, Tel Aviv University President, Professor Ariel Porat, to say a few words. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for this um, very special event. Um, Tel Aviv University has a vision of multidisciplinarity. As uh, you might know, at the university, we have uh, almost everything, all, almost all field of knowledge that you can think of exists at Tel Aviv University. And we want to try to exploit this advantage by creating bridges, mainly between the sciences on the one side and social sciences and humanities on the other side. And the center that has been established at Tel Aviv University, um, well, formally just a few weeks ago, but actually works for a few months, a center for AI and data science is a major example of this uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary vision. So this is a multidisciplinary center that we established at the university. At the core, we have uh, data science and AI. And the idea of the center is to create links between the core and all the fields of knowledge existing at the university. Uh, I remember uh, when I entered the office uh, almost uh, two years ago, I visited the School of uh, Computer Science. And then I had the idea, or uh, you know, uh, I'm a law professor, I'm not a scientist, but I had uh, some uh, superficial experience with the uh, uh, interaction between law and uh, AI. And I talked with the scientists at the School of uh, Computer Science and asked them whether they think that uh, creating a center that would combine AI and data science on the one side and social sciences and humanities on the other side, whether it would be attractive to them, to the computer scientists. It was quite clear to me that it is an attraction for people from coming from the from social sciences and humanities. It is an attraction for someone coming from law as myself. And I wondered whether they also see it as a challenge for them to create this kind of collaboration. Now, quite surprisingly, at least for me, some of the scientists say, no, there is no any advantage for us. Uh, there are users of AI, like uh, lawyers or uh, other uh, um, researchers coming from the west, uh, west part of the campus, which is uh, social sciences and humanities. But as it, as from our professional perspective, it's not a real challenge. It's just providing a service to others. But there were some others who thought otherwise. Now, I remember that a few months later, I met for the first time uh, with Yossi, Yossi Matthias. And uh, I uh, spoke, I talked to him about this uh, kind of a strange experience that I had with uh, our scientists. And Yossi told me, and Yossi, please correct me if I uh, misrepresent your uh, attitude. <laughs> Uh, but Yossi told me that one of the most important papers, I think that the one that uh, uh, brought you the, uh, the, the Gedel uh, Prize, right? A paper co-authored, I think, with Noga Alon and uh, maybe some others. And he told me that this paper, which is one of his best papers, I, I could imagine, actually, it's a theoretical paper, but the 
trigger to write the paper came with something, some experience or something that he saw on the ground, and that's what triggered him to write that specific paper. And I remembered it. So uh, later on, we had uh, some exchanges uh, with Yossi about uh, several issues relating to the uh, potential uh, collaboration between Google and Tel Aviv University. And uh, I con was convinced, and I think that many of my colleagues were convinced as well, that there is a huge potential in creating such a collaboration that would uh, take uh, AI and data science on one side and make the links with uh, scientists coming or researchers coming from uh, social sciences and uh, uh, humanities. Um, as I said, I'm a law professor and uh, just to give you uh, two uh, quick examples of how uh, research on AI might be relevant to law. I want to focus on actually two issues that I think everybody who works on uh, AI is aware of. One is uh, explainability and the other one is fairness. Right, from a perspective uh, of a law professor, what does it mean explainability? So a few years ago in the state of Alabama, uh, the legal system has uh, had a very interesting experience with using AI in courts. They wanted to use AI uh, for sentencing, right? To decide about the punishment that would be imposed upon a, an accused. And although it was clear to most of the people involved that the algorithm is more accurate than a human judge, there was an issue of explainability. You know, under legal tradition, it seems very strange to have a sentence without any explanation why that person got uh, three years in prison and why another one got uh, five years in prison. And this is something that the algorithm could not uh, do and could not replace a human judge. And the system in this way worked for a, a year and after a year, they replaced it again with a human judge because it was just impossible to have a sentencing uh, a mechanism without being able to explain why one person get a certain sentence and another one got another sentence. So explainability is definitely a challenge for people working on AI, at least when it is about the interaction with the law. You cannot have a legal system in which decisions are made without the ability to explain why a certain result has been achieved and not another one. Same thing with fairness. Right, we know that, uh, think about profiling, for example, right? You know, uh, law enforcement uses uh, profiling. We need to have uh, methods of profiling because we cannot uh, stop everyone at the airport. You need to have some criteria and it is done by mostly by human uh, agents. And again, the question is whether algorithm could do better. And it creates all kinds of uh, fairness problems that everybody works on AI and wants to contribute to profiling under the law must take into account. And again, another example of a challenge to AI scientists that could come from a legal practice. But there are uh, many examples from law and from other fields. So I'm a believer that uh, I hope I'm not wrong, but at least I have uh, Yossi Matthias on my side who has the same uh, view that it is not just that uh, users or uh, uh, researchers coming from uh, social sciences and humanities would benefit from AI, but also AI researchers could benefit from the interaction with uh, social sciences and uh, humanities. I'm very glad uh, that uh, we gather today to celebrate the establishment of uh, the collaboration between Tel Aviv University and uh, Google. I am very much looking forward to fruitful collaborations with uh, Yossi Matthias in particular and with Google uh, in general. Um, I also hope to deepen the collaborations and the relationship between Tel Aviv University and Google. And uh, as I said, I am looking forward to it. Thank you very much.
Oh, just before that, uh, Yossi, I think that you could come now and that there is a certificate that I should give you. So uh, that would be an opportunity to do it before you have to say, but before you say what you want to say. So there is a certificate here. Let me read it for you and for the audience. So this is to witness that on March 22, 2021, Tel Aviv University honored Google for establishing the Google AI for Social Good Initiative at the University Center for Artificial Intelligence and Data Science, which will foster novel cross-disciplinary and high impact research using AI methodologies to address universal social challenges, boost the number of researchers across campus who integrate AI tools into their research and galvanize the Tel Aviv University community toward new and exciting collaborations that unite core AI scientists with colleagues in the humanities, social sciences, and other diverse disciplines for the benefit of humanity. Uh, Professor Mark Steif and myself. Okay, we should do, put it this way. Okay, okay. Okay, just a second, let me. Settle? Okay. Today you settle. This is yours. Thank you, Ariel, and uh, thanks, Mia. Can you hear me now? Great. So thanks, Ariel, and uh, thanks, Mir, and thanks, everybody here. And uh, also thanks to my team, who was uh, those of you who could uh, join us uh, over uh, video conference. Really excited to be here today, and uh, for multiple reasons. I'm a great believer of the collaboration between science and technology. Uh, I'm here kind of both as a technologist and a scientist. Uh, a great believer in the collaboration between different disciplines. I think that when we bring together scientists from different disciplines and we find ways for them to work together and uh, blend the different ideas and approach, uh, then uh, good stuff happens. This is, by the way, true also for technology. When we bring together our different teams, then we see some magic happens. And I think when we bring it all together, then we're going to get much more than the sum of the parts. And I'm mostly excited about really the potential of making impact with uh, where we are. And uh, in particular, we are in a very unique uh, and distinct point where uh, the power of AI and data science is uh, unprecedented. And uh, we've already seen some uh, great impact on that. And I think it's already getting started because we see acceleration here. And it can influence, it's already influencing all aspects of life and it's going to influence even more aspects of society and um, uh, and science. And uh, Ariel mentioned a few examples and uh, about, and, and we had these uh, indeed very fruitful conversations, uh, sharing ideas. And the university is of course, uh, the ideal place to bring together the different disciplines. From my own personal experience, indeed, some of my best uh, research was influenced by interactions that I had with uh, other disciplines and actually by uh, being exposed to real problems. But it also goes the other way around. Everything that we do today is uh, sitting on the foundation of science and uh, technologies. Now, just uh, a little, almost 10 years ago, I had a, the opportunity to collaborate with the Israel Antiquity Authority to, bring, uh, to help bring the Dead Sea Scrolls online. And I remember when we had this discussion, it was quite clear that once we make the data available, then not only we make it accessible to everybody who wants to view that, but also we open up the opportunity for applying technologies on that. So I'm really excited that one of uh, that we've already seen some research coming out of that in the past decade, and uh, and we're going to hear a little bit about more of that today. But um, let me also connect it to an area that I'm uh, really passionate about, which is AI for social good. So a few years ago, we initiated Google, I uh, helped uh, initiate a Google an initiative where we, which we called AI for social good, which essentially is about how to harness the power of AI in order to try and address societal problems. 
And uh, we're, we took the approach of uh, looking how, what can we do internally within Google and how can we support the ecosystem at large in doing that. One observation was that there are many societal problems that today we can actually harness the power of machine learning and AI to try and solve and make progress on them. And uh, one such, uh, I think, inspirational example is a problem of, um, that uh, you'll hear later today from Sela, where we're using the power of machine learning in order to uh, help predict floods and, uh, and actually save lives. And just a few years ago, we kind of started it in an exploratory way. We weren't sure whether we can do anything about it. And today it's already in operation for a couple of years uh, with large impact. And we have other examples such as using AI to help um, harder hearing people to have phone conversations, which is transformative to their lives or other areas where we uh, use uh, AI and machine learning in order to help with medical uh, situations. Uh, another project I'm really excited about is about how to use real-time video analysis in order to help reduce the number of misses in, uh, in, in, in procedures such as colonoscopy, which again would be life-saving. But even if we go to the social sciences and humanities, I think the potential is huge in both directions, in the direction of how to leverage machine learning and AI to have uh, better studies of the, of the various fields, but also how to influence how we're thinking about technology and uh, some of the topics uh, that I really mentioned, I think are hugely important. Uh, the notion of how we take this powerful technology and make sure that we have what we call responsible AI, how to address uh, topics such as fairness, explainability, uh, ethics, and many others. And, uh, and again, years ago, I spent a lot of time working on privacy technology and I realized how important it is to collaborate with people who are actually thinking and working on that. One thing I'd like to mention is that when we think about how to use AI for societal problems, quite often people think, oh, this is about how to replace what, other, what people are doing or how to solve um, some very, very deep technological problems of understanding the matter. There are many ways in which technology can help. Uh, one such uh, very interesting uh, story I heard uh, last year was about this initiative that looks into how to help out in a situation of uh, uh, people who are on parole. It turns out that many people who are going on parole in the US are actually going back to jail. And one of the factors that influences whether or not they are going to go back to jail is the interaction that they have with the parole officer. So some group developed an AI system that all it did was actually help identify and prioritize who the parole officer need to make calls to. That's all. It did, wasn't about making calls. It wasn't about making any deep understanding. It was just prioritizing who to make the call to. And it turns out that the number of people going back to jail actually reduced dramatically. And this is one, so, so sometimes actually the help is in very different ways, but this also brings up some questions of how to make sure also the sustenance systems are equitable, fair, and are uh, taking all those into consideration. So these are just a few examples and, um, and, and really excited about how we can help and bring together and how to collaborate between uh, Google and uh, Tel Aviv University in, and we're going to do that in multiple ways. Obviously, we're going to hear about some projects and uh, really excited that we had uh, 27 uh, proposals and uh, of which uh, we, we could uh, select seven among the many uh, uh, great initiatives and we'll hear more about it today. Also great to see that we have uh, this variety. Um, I see we have from uh, zoology, from electrical engineering, economics, statistics, uh, school of health, biblical studies, earth sciences, and, uh, and of course, computer science. Uh, so this is uh, one way in which uh, we hope that we can actually foster some of this collaboration and work. Another way, of course, is to have some interactions. So for example, we're going to have uh, a biannual uh, machine learning joint seminar that is going to be led by uh, Moni Shaha from TEU and from Debbie Cohen from uh, uh, Google. Another way of collaboration, but um, I think it's kind of, we're getting started and we need to think about it as a pilot where we need to iterate and see other ways in which we can actually find value and hopefully inspire more people to get into this. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, let me just uh, wish all the, uh, and invite more people to come into the conversation. And again, uh, typically we don't know what we don't know. So I really encourage to have these conversations between different people, uh, people from different disciplines. And I'm looking forward for collaboration and to hearing what uh, people are coming up with. And again, thanks for the partnership. Thank you in particular, Ariel, Meir, and everybody on the committee who worked hard to actually uh, evaluate those 27 proposals and come up with those uh, seven and everybody else who is uh, harnessing their time and attention.
for this collaboration. Thank you very much. See, I have a short presentation. Um, how do I get it? I'm going to talk about that now. Show me, I'll show it. Thank you very much. So again, thank you very much, Yossi. And uh, I would like to use this opportunity um, actually to uh, present shortly the center, the Tel Aviv University Center for Artificial Intelligence and, and Data Science. Um, the initiative that we inaugurate today of Google um, for social for social good uh, will be incorporate, incorporated within the center activities. Um, and since we have a few visitors here and guests, uh, I really like to uh, make this uh, short presentation of uh, describing the missions of the center and how this initiative is incorporated in our activities. So indeed, it's, Tel Aviv University is a multidisciplinary university. Uh, we have everything and um, it gives us a great opportunity. And when we started to uh, compose the center and its activities, and we asked researchers around the campus if they like to participate, we were surprised by how many researchers uh, came up and wanted to uh, be involved in the in the center. We have over 200 researchers uh, who want to be affiliated with the center. We have to organize them into research group, um, and we really have to make this um, a desire uh, not just to be um, in, in in the air, but really uh, translated to real activities. Um, now the. Advantage of Tel Aviv University is not just by its diversity, but, but, but by the fact that we have strong uh, researchers. We have strong uh, core researchers in computer science, in uh, engineering, in statistics, uh, and we have uh, so many good researchers in diverse applications, um, spans from humanities to physical science, to life science, to neuroscience, and so on. So this is the opportunity. The center itself has started, or maybe the trigger for that was an initiative of uh, actually the state of Israel. Um, and it was led by um, some committee that was led by Yoav Binyamini. We'll, we'll say a few words on that later on. And now it's called the Israel Data Science Initiative. And now we have this collaboration with Google that we celebrate today. And of course, we would like to um, have more bodies um, in the industry and others to be involved uh, in the center. Uh, you can see now the academic management of the center and an important part of the center is the bridge that try to make those connections between application researchers and co-researchers a reality. We need to help uh, to make those co this collaboration happens and we call this uh, body the bridge and we have a person that lead that bridge and he will also uh, lead this uh, seminar, joint seminar that we have with Google. Now, when we establish the missions of the center, uh, we set five missions. The first one seems trivial. We have a strong team uh, of core researchers on the fundamental of machine learning, data science, AI, and uh, we would like to build a community of those researchers, how that they will keep working together even closer and really contribute to the understanding of the fundamentals 
of these important issues, uh, it works, it makes an influence, but we still do not understand many things why it works and how to make it work properly, how to make it really an engineering uh, tool that we can control and understand. So this is one mission to enhance the core research in Tel Aviv University. The second, maybe more important mission is to do this interdisciplinary research with all the, facu where, with all the faculties in the campus. And part of that is the bridge that I discussed before. And here again, it's a huge potential. Um, I must admit, I'm 31 years in the university and I didn't know how much uh, interesting research is done in many uh, part of the campus. And uh, it's really interesting to see how um, things that seem remote and far away uh, have a potential with this uh, uh, AI that can really shed light on main, many scientific problems, um, uh, not to mention practical engineering problem in really diverse areas. The third mission, uh, we would like to be a, a center that will help researchers uh, in, in a, a, or facilitate researchers to, to have good research in AI and data science. For that, we took the mission of establishing infrastructure and resources. Uh, there are many computational resources spread around the campus. They are, they are not organized. Usually they are held by some specific researchers. We would like to unite and really build an infrastructure of computational resources, storage, pipeline, software, how to access those resources easily, and also interesting databases. Um, AI and data science, after all, is built on data, and we need to have interesting data. Uh, with that data, we can come to interesting scientific conclusions, but we have to build those databases, and it comes to um, cases like medical records, um, and the data exists, but it's spread around, especially in Israel. We have the um, HMOs, Kupot Cholim, and we have the hospitals, and, and we see how efficient they were in the vaccination process that we just passed, but we like to have this data accessible to our researchers, and uh, we, would, we don't want to keep it to ourselves. Uh, all the achievement will be open sources and uh, can be accessed outside the university and can be accessed to all researchers in the university. And here we get to that mission where uh, Google's uh, initiative really uh, is part of. Uh, we have responsible for society and uh, well, there are some scientific issues that are related to AI and society, but there is also the society around us. Uh, which uh, includes, uh, well, IT companies. Um, this is in this, I don't know if you can see the name of the companies, but there are so many startup companies in the AI area in, now in Israel. Uh, I know some of them very closely. And we would like to uh, collaborate to help our students are in those companies. Uh, and of course, the big companies like uh, Google and others, and also government agencies, um, this is, I mean, the responsibility that we have to the society, both in research, in research and uh, in help. And the last mission is, of course, education. I would say, I don't want to go over the slide, but one vision would say that every student in Tel Aviv University uh, will be literate, some, no matter what, what he studies in, in AI. That's something that will change. I mean, it's already changing the world and you, you cannot graduate from Tel Aviv University without hearing uh, AI at all. But we have more ambitious uh, ideas. I hope we, we can fulfill them uh, in undergraduate programs, in graduate programs, in online courses. And that's the fifth mission of our center. And when we try to structure that, uh, since it's so diverse and this center hopefully will be strong and big, um, we can see AI and society, but we can see many groups, as I said, 200 researchers, and they will be split into groups, maybe overlap group in so many areas. Uh, just some of the researchers that came to us helped us to, to write those titles like transportation, smart cities, of course, AI and society, digital humanities. We will hear a little bit about them, physical, sciences, health and biomed, life science, neuroscience, and so on. 
And of course, the resources and all the good things that I discussed before, this is how we want to handle it. And um, hopefully in a year or two or five, it will be something that we can all be proud of. The center is already working. Um, we have already, uh, as we said, we started with a grant from uh, Malag, the state of Israel, and we have already 18 funded projects that are spent over core and application areas. And in addition to the funded project, the bridge is working. So there are collaboration and uh, the people in the bridge helping researchers from uh, uh, different disciplines to pursue the research um, through this uh, body that we call the bridge. Now, let me indeed uh, discuss uh, the, um, the, the event that we celebrate today uh, with Google Initiative, which we appreciate a lot, uh, we were able to come up with a, a call for proposal on AI for social good. And as Yossi said, we were really, I don't want to surprise, but we were really happy to get 27 uh, research proposal in a really short time. And um, it was really, um, I mean, the proposal were excellent. Uh, we, and we had a short time and it was really hard to um, um, decide which, we, which project uh, we want to fund. And eventually there were 10 projects uh, out of them. And again, I, uh, I'm, uh, I appreciate Google for that. Seven of them um, uh, are funded by Google and the center by its own resources fund additional three projects. And uh, as you can see, they are on diverse areas and we will hear some of those um, projects that are now starting in the, in the next few minutes. So let's go to work, welcome all, and let's go to the presentation of the projects. And we are going now to hear five of those uh, projects that I just described. Uh, they will tell us, we have five minutes. Uh, I'm sorry that I took another minute from your time, but we will try to keep the five minute uh, time sc schedule. So the first project, uh, is led by Professor Jonathan Belmaker, and it talks about early warning for invasive Mediterranean fishes. Jonathan, please. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, this project is a collaboration between myself from the School of Zoology and the Steinhardt Museum of Natural History and Raja from the School of uh, Electrical Engineering. And the aim of this project is basically to tackle a huge problem in the natural world with an invasion of species. So species are invading all over the world and it's a huge problem, both in terms of natural systems and in terms of human economy and human health. And the problem in our area is the worst in the world. Okay, so the Red Sea and the Mediterranean have been separated for millions of years and been reconnected exactly 150 years ago due to the construction of the Suez Canal. Now, since then, there have been an accelerating number of species moving from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. And the situation in the Mediterranean is that the number of invasive and their impact is the largest in the world. Okay, and not only that, it's species from here and they're moving to Turkey and Greece and Italy and France. So people are looking at us to see what we're going to tackle, how we're going to tackle this problem to understand what they should do also. So it's a major problem. I'm going to give a few examples to so understand the impact. First of all, in terms of the numbers, the red bars over there are the number of invasive uh, fish species in the sample, and the blue are native species. So the number of invasive species are higher than the number of native species when you go into the water over here off the coast of Tel Aviv. And what are the impacts? So there are huge impacts, both in terms of human health and in terms of natural systems. I'll give you a few examples. One example is the striped catfish, which uh, came into the Mediterranean just 15 years ago. Now it's one of the most abundant species in shallow water. You don't see it when you dive because it lives at night. But fishermen go out at night and their net is completely clogged with the species. So they can't catch any fish to sell. Okay, they have no economical benefit because it's completely clogged with nets. Not only that, it's an invasive, uh, 
it's a venomous species. It has three spines on its back and, and fins, and it actually can hurt people, and people have known to die from the species uh, in different places in the world. And it's really, really painful. I've been stung a few times from this, this species. So it's a terrible problem. A different problem is oh, lionfish. Lionfish are a very beautiful species. They're in the Red Sea. You go and see them when you dive in, in a lot. But they're also invasive species. So in the Caribbean, they've been let out from aquarium. People can't handle them anymore. They've been put into the water. And now they're all the way from Brazil, all the way up to New York. They're every place. And they devastate native, native fish. So they go into a reef, and they eat all the naive, small species, and they leave nothing. Okay, so the huge, huge, terrible problem. And now they've been seen also in the Mediterranean. They're being accelerating, the numbers are increasing all the time. And we really want to know what to do about them. The last example, I'm going to show you this picture of a classical uh, rocky reef over here in the Mediterranean. And it's basically a desert. It's a very low biomass. You don't see too many fish. It's not so nice. If you had come 50 years ago, you would have seen sea grass and algae, a lot of small fish, a lot of crabs, stuff like that. And the reason we're in this situation now is because of these species, two species called rabbit fish, which graze, they eat all the, all the algae and leave nothing. Okay, so this is a huge transformation and it reduces uh, the number of fish the fishermen can catch. It, it has a huge impact on the, on, the, on the environment. Now with all these invasive species, the critical thing is to detect them when they, right, when they arrive. If they're already established, they have a big population, you can't take them out of the water anymore, it's too late. So you want to get the first, second, third individual, catch them, take them out of the system so the system can, can resume its balance. And this is a critical thing. You want to do it as fast as possible. For the lionfish, we saw the first individuals coming in, but the Nature and Parks Authority said, okay, we can't take, we can't take care of it because it's a, it's a protected species in the Red Sea. We don't want to take them out. And by the time they actually got the grip together, we were, we were too late. So we have to act really, really fast to take them out right at the beginning. So the aim of this project is to create an early warning system to detect these invasive bites when they come in and also track real time the spatial temporal dynamics of native species and invasive species. Now what we're going to do, we're going to use citizen science data, um, which is a lot of projects going to the water and taking pictures of the fish, but don't know what you're, what you're seeing basically. A lot of data in the social media, images, people going to the water, snorkeling, diving, uh, and taking pictures of the fish. And also we're going to use cameras. So there's a camera from my master a long, long, long time ago. And we also have other, other data uh, we're collecting in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. So I don't see, okay. So if you put the camera in the water, typically you get a lot of, Okay, I didn't expect this to work, but <laughs> you get a lot of species that you can actually use to, to train the data and also to track um, the invasive. On the left, you can see now, but that picture we took from the port in Tel Aviv, which is very murky, very, very uh, bad visibility. We saw a very rare species we didn't need to expect there. We didn't uh, expect to see them. So we're going to use all this data to try and track the dynamic on invasive species. Usually it's very hard to track invasive species because they're not known in the system. We can train the data as much as we want. When a new species come in, comes in, we won't be able to identify it. And here we have the advantage that we can train the data in the Red Sea. So we take all these species in the Red Sea, can identify them, train the data there, know what they are. And then when the first individual comes into Mediterranean, we already know where the AI algorithm already knows how to track it, how to identify it. We know exactly what it is, even though it's very, very rare. That's usually not possible with invasive species. But we do have the advantage we have the data both from the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. This will allow us to detect the first individuals, hopefully tackle the problem, and also track their numbers and their, and their spread through the Mediterranean. I just want to thank uh, Victor, which is, uh, which is responsible for preliminary results in this project, and Uri Walsh, collaborator from uh, Ben Gurion University. Ask a quick question. Eli? Okay. So, um, next, another interesting project will be presented by uh, Dr. Bonnie Levin Asher, and it talks about an AI based model for automatic coding of pre linguistic behavior in infants. Well, I have uh, grandchildren already, so I would, I'm really anxious to hear that. So, thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
אתה יכול לעשות ב-advanced, אתה יכול לעשות portion of screen, טוב, לא משנה, לא משנה, בסדר, נסתדר. So, hi, my name is Boni Levin Asher, and I'm a speech and language clinician. אולי לא. I'm wearing it. Um, so again, my name is Bonnie Levine Asher, and I am a speech and language clinician that specializes in early language development. Uh, Professor Uliat Kishon Rabin and I work at the Department of Communication Disorders at Tel Aviv University. And our proposal for social good is AI-based model for automatic coding of pre-linguistic behaviors in infants. The first three years of life are critical for brain development. and they affect later academic, social, and personal achievements. Recent data show that language plays a critical role in the development of the brain in the earlier years. So early diagnosis of language delays increases the effectiveness of intervention and reduce and prevent developmental gaps. Children from low socioeconomic status have known to, to have significant language delay that uh, affect their academic achievements and limit the opportunities of, in life. There are about 800,000 children in Israel that were unfortunate to be born to families from such a disadvantaged background. The process of language development begins from birth and even earlier. In the beginning, in the prelinguistic uh, period, infants learn to communicate by babbling, gazes, facial expressions, and hand gestures in certain sequences, depending on the intention of the speaker. These are learned by statistical learning and imitation and are known to form the foundation of spoken language. Moreover, a major factor that influences the development of language is the interaction between the infant and his caregiver in the first months of life. While the process of language development begins in the, in the first months of life, most diagnostic tools available today um, assess language development only at around one year or older when the child begins to, to speak his first words. This is a bit late when we know that early intervention uh, leads to better outcome. So the earlier, the better. In a recent study that we, in which we analyzed the multimodal productions of infants and their caregivers using a dedicated software, we found that uh, certain sequences of prelinguistic behaviors at the age of three months old predict language at the age of 15 months. We also found using the same method that the uh, linguistic gaps between infants of low and high socioeconomic status are already evident at the age of three months. Uh, unfortunately, the implementing of this procedure to clinical setting is limited due to the fact that um, uh, the manual coding that you use is time consuming and uh, professional labor is costly. For example, the coding of one behavior in uh, one minute of a video takes about one hour when conducted by an uh, experienced professional. So um, recent technological advances offer an opportunity to develop AI-based model for automatic coding of the prelinguistic behaviors. So with the help of computer scientists, we intend to analyze the communicative interaction between infants and their caregivers by using hand gesture recognition, uh, speaker recognition, and eye contact recognition. We plan to optimize the algorithms using our manually collected data and test it with newly collected data. So we, have, we hope that this project 
we led to the development of automatic coding for the sequence of pre-linguistic behaviors and will be sent to sensitive to identifying abnormal patterns of behavior. So hopefully the automatic system will assist in early diagnosis of abnormal patterns of behaviors at three months old. We later on intend to extract linguistic characteristics of the conversation, for example, the number of different words, by applying speech recognition to meaningful conversations. Such a system could be a game changer of successful intervention in children of low socioeconomic status who are at risk for language delay and therefore can have a significant impact in closing social disparities. We would like to thank the committee of TAD and Google for believing in our project and its potential contribution to social good. We would also like to thank Google and TED for the financial support and, giving, and for giving us the opportunity to realize our dream. And thank you all for listening to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Question, why we prepare the next... Uh... Let's go. Oh. Okay. You look at children in Israel, I think, right? Right. Do you think there can be a difference between uh, in other, other languages or uh, other countries? Or... <laughs> Maybe later. Maybe later. Yes. Because this is a universal uh, behavior of some other. The, the prelinguistic behavior is universal, so there is possibility. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much again. And um, I may say that uh, part of the center activities, uh, we chose this proposal because of the availability of data and the quality of the proposed research. But we see here that the center will enable and find a, a collaboration with data scientists and uh, AI people that can participate in this research to make it, uh, of course, uh, the best we can do. Okay, the next um, uh, proposal um, is by a co-researcher that, for my department actually, uh, Dr. Roy Livni, and this research has social impacts. The title is Balancing Fair, and U F Fair Use and Copyright in the presence of big and synthetic data. Oui, please. Okay, uh, hi. So, um, so one of the recent, uh, I think, intriguing and interesting developments in uh, AI and machine learning is the ability of uh, learning machines not only to do supervised learning or uh, reinforcement learning, but actually uh, they are starting to create or to generate uh, new data. Uh, so these are examples for uh, uh, output of machines that got to see examples of uh, images or uh, photos or uh, anything you want. And they, they are basically try, trying to generate uh, new things like that. Oh, sorry. Um, so the left image is actually uh, the book cover of a book about uh, deep learning. And the book cover is was generated uh, by, a, by a machine. Um, and one of the questions that uh, comes to mind in this uh, setting is, are we making sure that this machine will not actually plagiarize or uh, violate copyright of the data? Because eventually uh, uh, machine learning are using massive corpus of data. Uh, they no are known to memorize the data. 
they uh, harvest it to its fullest. And if we don't make sure of these things, then we cannot be sure that uh, these machines did not actually do some uh, copyright violation or even just memorize the data and just output. Um, now, this is not even a problem uh, that has to do with machine. We have this problem way before. Even in human interaction, um, there is this problem that sometimes people are violating copyright, and it's not even that clear when this happens. So this is an example for a song that was written for a Eurovision a toy, and later on, uh, the band White Stripes uh, accused uh, the writers that they plagiarize the data. And even, even in this human interaction, it's, it's a question that uh, it's not clear. It's a, it's a gray zone where did they copy the data? What does this mean to copy the data? How do we, how do we decide if they violated copyright? And now on top of this problem, we are gonna add the fact that there are gonna be these big, large machines that are gonna harvest all the data and they have access to massive amount of data. And then let's say someone accuses such a uh, output of the machine as copywriting or violating their, uh, their copyrights, uh, intellectual property or something like that, then how do we decide uh, what, who is right, who is wrong, and what does it mean uh, to copy in this situation? So overall, this project aims to uh, study uh, artificial intelligence uh, where uh, we wanna build, allow machines to exploit big data, we want to let them still use state-of-the-art machines. Uh, on the other hand, we want to make sure that they do respect intellectual property, they do preserve copyright. We want to develop some notion of fair use data in this setting of uh, uh, big data. Um, so a little bit about what we've been able to do so far. So, so far, um, we kind of uh, uh, took the, the idea of uh, differential privacy as some criterion or a, a first definition or first notion to, as, to use as uh, to explain what it means not to copy. So I won't go into the actual equations and, and definition, but roughly the problem of privacy is the problem where you have data and you want to produce output where the output doesn't tell you anything about, uh, about the individuals in your data. And you can think of this as some criterion that allows you not to, to avoid copying because once you don't know anything about the data or you could replace the data and get the same output, then in some sense, you did not copy uh, the data. Um, and, and so far, the work we had so far was about actually char characterizing this problem in this, taking this definition of differential privacy, where we studied um, what is the sample complexity and of, of actually generating synthetic data while not violating privacy. So this is one uh, uh, research direction that we are still working on, computational questions about this and how can this be done, uh, scalability and so on. And also we would like to think uh, about more refined notions. So, so far uh, the notion of differential privacy is, is very interesting, but it is intended for a different task of preserving privacy. Maybe for this task of copyright protections and fair use, we can come up with more adequate and more uh, fine-tuned notions and then study what is, again, the sample complexity, computational question, and uh, so on. This is it. I think there are many social application of copyright um, and it's nice that um, we can answer that in a, a rigorous mathematical way. Uh, and that so far, it's not Okay. Okay. 
Um, the next project um, in totally different area, humanities, um, but really an interesting topic. And um, as, as we saw the proposal, it was an excellent proposal. Uh, so the next presentation is given by Professor uh, Jonathan Bendov from Bible Studies, Chug uh, Mikra, opening the Dead Sea Scrolls to the world. Isn't that great? Okay, we will skip a few lectures and actually we will use the opportunity to hear something from, the ad, from Google, from our um, a collaborator in this uh, initiative. Uh, I would like to invite um, Mr. Sela Nevo from Google Israel, uh, the head of the Flood Forecasting Initiative. Sela, please. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sela. I had the privilege of uh, receiving my academic education here in Tel Aviv and then utilizing that knowledge at Google. So it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here. And today I want to talk about Google's flood forecasting initiative. And I want to start with a real world example of how floods can affect people's lives. What you're seeing here is a flood that occurred in uh, the Narwar village in Bihar, India. Um, and while the video that you're seeing now was taken during the day, uh, floodwaters originally began to rise at night and there was no warning for this flood. Uh, we had the opportunity of visiting that village uh, only two days after this video was taken and uh, sadly, there were only a few houses left standing in that whole village. The, and two people, tragically, died that night, and things could have been even much worse. Uh, while we were there, Yossi and I had the privilege of meeting Rakesh, who was a young man who was one of the only people who knew how to swim in that village, and spent hours swimming through raging floodwaters that you just saw, carrying one by one dozens of people to safety. Now there's a lot that only people like Rakesh on the ground can do to help. Uh, not everything you know, we can do here from the safety of our homes, but there are some things that we can do. And that's the reason we started the Google Flood Forecasting Initiative. Hundreds of millions of people every year are affected by floods and not all of them have the information they need to stay safe and informed when these kinds of events occur. We do three main things. And I wanna go over them one by one and kind of say how machine learning takes part in each of these components. The first component, what's called a hydrologic model. This is a model that translates things like precipitation and temperature into a forecast of what will happen in the river in a few hours uh, and even a few days. And these models are usually done using what's called conceptual models. These are relatively simple models that represent the physical processes involved. And these models have been incrementally improving throughout time, but haven't meaningfully changed since the 1970s. What we've done in this space is take a completely different paradigm. We use a network of neural networks that represents the whole riverine system. And what they do is by utilizing information from all basins across the world, or at least many basins across the world, we learn the underlying physics and we've been able to show better than the original conceptual models that are explicitly defined by hydrologists. The second component is what's called the inundation model. This allows us to translate forecasts about what will happen in the river, like the Ganges will rise by a meter, into a spatially accurate forecast. What villages are going to be affected, how high floodwaters are going to be in different neighborhoods. And here, the way these are classically solved is through finite different solutions to the same non equations. This is a fancy way of saying, here we actually do understand the physics. We can solve the physical equations and understand what's going on, but it's incredibly sensitive to the quality of the data that you have. And in many of the places that are most heavily affected, we don't have that data. 
Here we've taken a slightly different approach and combined existing physics-based models and physical principles with machine learning-based components, allowing for systems that can be applied in data-scarce regions, that can scale much, more, much better than classical physical models, and in many situations are even more accurate. All of these have led to unprecedented accuracy in each step of the way and allows us to provide people with information that they know is both accurate and reliable. Now, of course, none of this is valuable if we don't make sure that that information reaches the right people at the right time, and we have several strategies for doing so. First, we utilize Google's existing products that are viewed by billions of people every day to make sure that people get this information immediately. We put it on a Google search, we put it on Google Maps, and we actively send people notifications if they are in immediate danger. But we also use strategic partnerships with local governments and with NGOs like the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies to make sure that even people who don't have access to Google products or the internet as a whole can receive this critical information. Our operational flood forecasting systems now cover more than 220 million people across India and Bangladesh and we're working hard to expand them globally. So to conclude, we hope that these different components and models can help people stay more safe and informed in times of danger. And thank you all for your time and for listening. so we fix the technical glitches Jonathan about okay. this call. Sorry about that. The project will go smoother, I hope. Uh, and now to something completely different. As they say, something completely different, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I am happy to present a project that uh, is being taking place with Nahum Dershowitz from the Computer Science Department here in Tel Aviv. Uh, I am myself a philologist and the scholar of ancient languages and texts. I work with dictionaries and grammars and uh, commentary books, but I also read the scrolls, ancient scrolls. And it's amazing to see the amount of data that is hidden there inside all of these scrolls and what could be done with this data. So I'm completely following my own classical research, but I will also pursue digital research and uh, well, um, data sciences, because I think all of us people in the humanities have enormous amounts of data and a lot could be done with it. And we just need to know what to do and we need to cooperate with the right people like I am fortunate to have here. Uh, this is where, what our goal is to adapt various algorithms in computer vision and machine learning, turning them into practical methods that can be applied to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, Fortunately for us, there is this interesting, fascinating website uh, in which actually Google has part from its very inception and Yossi Matias here personally was involved in it. So I'm very happy to actually take this vision slightly forward. Uh, this is a website that started in 2006 or 2010, I think, with new multi-spectral uh, images of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So completely new set of images of the Dead Sea Scrolls with an enormous amount of data uh, that really carried our research to future, you know, enormous uh, advances. Um, and with what's important for this project also with open access. So people can reach this website and there's an enormous numbers of, user, of users annually for this website. What we do is trying to carry this website forward and make more advanced tools for the use of the public uh, in this website and in other derivative, derivatives that will be taken away from it. So, well, I will not even give this super short introduction because everybody absolutely knows what the Dead Sea Scrolls are and why they are important. And they give us a sense of history, history of Judaism, in some way, history of Christianity, 
and you know uh, fundamental questions for what we all are uh this is a project from which our project kind of forks it's a project uh, um, uh, funded by dfg by deep scripta comranica electronica and we are forking away from that project using more uh, data tools to advance what we do so here is here are how the dead sea scrolls looked when they came out of the caves uh, with about a hundred thousand small fragments and this is a wonderful picture at the of those colors in the 1950s pouring at these fragments trying to trying to do something about them and our project uh, the thing that we would like to develop here is the connection between these new super fascinating multispectral images and these old ones because as it turns out in the 1950s the fragments held more information and there is more information we should extract from these old photos as well images as well the problem is how to do it this is how the old images from the 1950s look a wonderful super skilled palestinian photographer working in the palestine archaeological museum in the 1950s by the name of najib albina and he created these images tens hundreds of fragments on each plate and now the point is that we would like to isolate them using image recognition technologies and machine learning because if we want to pinpoint a new uh, uh, image and connect it to an older one here is what we need to do to teach the machine to isolate them uh, like today you can isolate Im uh, people pictures of people with google but we want to do it with fragments taken in black and white in very bad quality and that's even worse and for example this small tiny fragment that's only about a square inch large yes but it has several representations on several images about 10 12 different representations for us it's important to recognize all of them so we need first of all to remove these fragments from their background which seem to be a very difficult problem computational problem uh, for me it's nonsense but for actually for the computer it's a computational problem because the the black ink is really the same as the black felt of the background uh, that is a problem and Nahum and his team have been working there is good advance and we will finish it and give scholars access to it we need to isolate the fragments from the plate we need to remove them from the shadow because in the old 1950s so this is a computational problem uh, because in the 1950s they uh, there were shadows to the images and we need to separate them from the shadows and actually create what we would like to say a kind of image wheel uh, to provide scholars on the website with an image wheel for every the history of imagery for every fragment if we move on and try to say uh, so here are some problems that we uh, the machine need needs to be taught how to differentiate between ink between the background and between a hole in the fragment that's a problem it takes many hours to teach the machine to do that and once you do it uh, you need to match the back and the front of the fragment uh, in in various ways to binarize it uh, and as you move on we would like to just to give you a, an image of a fragment and you could locate it on on uh, on a plate once we do it the point is to make registration so registration that is make a mathematical construct that would make could create a hybrid to put, put together five six ten different images and put the information from them all together into one entity and kind of stretch them one on top of each other all and all of these tools will be actually given access to scholars this is where the website will actually fit in so the website that we are now developing and where all of these computational tools will be will have a practical uh, approach and will be given to scholars at their fingertips to use uh, as they use them uh, isolating them from the uh, from the plates and create them adding the text to them and eventually modeling each manuscript creating a canvas for each manuscript and placing each fragment in its various representations together with creating a font that we create automatically for every scroll so there are 900 scrolls eventually we can teach our machines to simulate a font for each one of the scrolls uh, and then create the exact canvas for each of them this will be at the fingertips of each scholar if we succeed in that there are many other manuscripts out there i mean we have the dead sea scroll this is 900 manuscripts but there are thousands of ancient manuscripts in greek in latin in arabic 
in whatever language you can think of, in Tibetan, in Sanskrit. They are all fragmentary and out there. And if these tools develop, they can be helpful for each and any of these uh, ventures out there. Uh, another thing we will do is to map, and this will be probably the last thing that I present here, is to map each region on the image to map it with the actual text that it represents. Uh, this is done now semi-manually, but we are working on algorithms that we actually teach uh, the, uh, the machine to do OCR, okay, character recognition of these ancient manuscripts, and eventually generate character maps like these. This is important for paleographers and for people who date the scrolls, so we can, um, we can generate them now. And eventually projects that are now in the pipeline and will be done through this thing, is to actually make the computer designate a line of this ancient manuscript and mark each of the letters as a region and connect it automatically to a letter in the transcription. And once this is done, then actually the sky's the limit. So what we can do is, is really with the text and the image is, so it's huge amounts of big data that could really do wonders in, in the way we understand these ancient manuscripts. Finally, everything, the API is open in that website and whatever we do, people can connect to the API and pull out the image material, the text material, because the access to the Dead Sea Scrolls has not been open enough in history and we would like to correct that. Thank you very much. The next speaker, actually this will be the last presentation from the uh, from the call for social goods is Dr. Uh, Ophir Levy um, and he will talk about developing high resolution climate mapping and incident detection model to reduce risk to food production under climate change. So it's a zoology problem but with a lot of social uh, effects. Uh, Ophir, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, so first I would like to thank uh, the Google TED initiative for funding this project. And we all heard about uh, climate change and it brings some, uh, you know, bizarre moments. Sometimes this is a moment, uh, this is an image from Paris during the heat wave of 2019. Uh, the degrees, uh, went up to up to 42 degrees Celsius, it was pretty high. Um, but some moments can be devastating, um, especially you know, when we talk about our food production. This is an example of a, of a field crop that was hit by a, by a heat wave. And one of uh, the objectives of, of this project is to try to use AI to model macroclimates um, in crop fields that can help identify a risk of overheating uh, for crop fields. And in my lab, uh, we are using uh, a drone with a thermal camera to try to map microclimates at different areas in Israel. This is one area near uh, Zichon Yaakov here in Israel. And when we uh, flew the drone at 6 a.m., these are the microclimates that we see. The color is, uh, is the temperature at 6 a.m. at 15 centimeters resolution, pretty high uh, resolution. And you can see throughout the day how the microclimates are changing in this area. And the idea of, um, in this project is to try uh, to use a lot of maps that we created using the drone. And we also uh, collected the meteorological data uh, during these flights. And, and once we have a lot of data, uh, we can actually try to use artificial intelligence models to try to predict microclimates. Um, at every time where that we have meteorological data for that. And the idea is to use it in natural areas, but also when we talk about crops, we can use the same model to try to predict the microclimates at uh, crop fields. And using this kind of data, we can actually predict uh, heat waves beforehand, and we can actually try to, uh, uh, to understand what kind of crops can be used at different areas um, in Israel under climate change. Another risk that we have for crops um, all over the world is the risk of, uh, of uh, insect pests. Uh, we know, for example, that insect pests um, 
are trying to be, are beginning to be observed at areas where, where we couldn't find them before. Areas that uh, were too cold uh, before climate change. This is just an example of the South American tomato moth. Uh, it actually invaded Africa a long time ago, but now it's, it's, it's also beginning to, uh, uh, to be observed in Europe, all over Europe actually, because Europe, uh, the winters of Europe are not so cold as they used to be. Um, we try, so we, we are actually looking, seeing new pests at new areas all over the world. And one of the, the key things that can protect uh, crop fields from pests is the early detection. And, and the idea, the second objective of this project is to try to develop an early, de early detection uh, model using artificial intelligence uh, tools. And the idea is that you can put uh, cameras at, uh, at areas at risk in crop fields. And these areas, are, for example, time-lapse cameras can uh, take photos um, every certain minute, so every hour. And the idea is to have an artificial intelligence model that scan the images and try to uh, detect uh, uh, pests in these images. And um, a first step uh, for this kind of model is to try to build an insect detection model. And in my lab, we actually uh, put um, like 16 cameras uh, in different places in Israel, and we collected more than a million uh, images. And sometimes um, we have insects passing through like the, the area that is uh, covered by the, by the cameras. We also collected some temperatures and humidity uh, that are next to each uh, camera. And using this uh, huge data set, we are trying to build an insect detection model um, and that is pretty challenging because sometimes the insects really look like the background. Um, we were able to use a very simple model uh, to predict, uh, uh, to actually detect uh, uh, beetles uh, in the images. Um, a, a very challenging task is to detect a grasshopper because it, it has a very high uh, camouflage uh, compared to the background. And we're also able to detect uh, small insects like uh, small ants. Uh, in, in images. And the idea is that all these tools, uh, these AI tools that in this project can help uh, protect our, um, our crops, our food production. Uh, they also have, you know, other um, areas or fields that, that they can be helpful. For example, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, disease agents, like, uh, you know, insects that can uh, transform uh, diseases from, uh, um, uh, from area to area and so on. So, oh, uh, thank you. Why don't we turn the next talk? Uh, actually, the, uh, before this initiative, we had a collaboration uh, with Google in another initiative related to COVID-19. And so I would like to invite uh, Dr. Daniel Avo uh, from the Department of Statistics and Operation Research to talk about high resolution modeling and optimal intervention to control the spread of COVID-19 in Israel. It has to be short because we are running out of yeah. time, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I'll and give it three and a half minutes. Yeah. Five o'clock. Daniel, I can trust you. <laughs> and just after the study, we have the slides. Let me say, Daniel, Daniel also got another award on this program of uh, the social group. Perfect. So. So yeah. We good. Don't count this time. <laughs> Don't start the clock yet. Okay. Uh, five, I, I see you have five slides. That's good. Uh, six. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. So this is a project uh, co-led by Uri Obolski and myself. Some people say that COVID is over. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Yeah. So I want to start with a tale of two cities, Hulon and Nebrak, 10 kilometers apart similar population size, about 200,000 people, slightly over it, but really different COVID-19 spread. So this figure on the left is the daily uh, new number of cases in Nebrak in Hulon in 2020. In 2020. And, and we wanna ask ourselves, we know, you know, we have some answers in our mind, but we wanna ask ourselves, can we explain it using data, these differences? So can we capture this variation using, for example, the difference in demographics between these two cities? So the figure in the right, shows the difference in the age distribution in Hulon and Nebrak 
And of course, they vary with respect to other variables, such as household size or participation in the workforce, right? So to do that, we constructed the Trillard agent-based model. So basically what we did, we took um, uh, data from the Israeli Census Bureau of Statistics, I hope I said it right, um, of the largest 200 cities in Israel and created the synthetic populations that mimic the populations in the population in Israel in each and each cities according to the household size, age, and so on. And we take each person and we, um, and we give him some places where he goes. He has its own household, um, workplace, school, kindergarten, depending on his age, neighborhood, and city. Once we have this synthetic static population, we bring it to life by adding social interactions. Each person in the, each person in each city or in the model in the population is a number of interactions on a daily basis at each and each of their environments. So there's data about how to simulate the stuff, how many interactions we have per day. Once we have this dynamic population, we can throw a pandemic at it, right? We can take some initial number of people, infect them, of course, and then use data from Israel and from the world about the epidemiological and clinical behavior of disease and follow through the population and take a step back and look at the outbreak dynamics. So doing that again in Bnei Brak and Hulon, very two different cities, we look at exact same scenario in two different cities, starting with a very st a strict quarantine, then a partial relaxation, opening schools maybe, but keeping a, a partial quarantine, and then no restriction at all. And what we see in these figures, in these figures are the, the dash line are the number of susceptible people that are still healthy, but might get infected and the number of infected. And what we see is that the dynamic is completely different in the two cities, even though the total number of people is exactly the same. So we talk about social good. So this is all started in collaboration with the municipality of Nebrak and the IDF with the help of actually with the help of IDF programmers who got stuck outside of their base during the first quarantine. And we were asked to consult the municipality of Nebrak and the IDF, who was then running the stuff. How do they leave? How do they finish the first quarantine? And they had to compare and take into account a lot, a lot of variables um, and a lot of possible options, like um, who do we send to school on, on what basis and how do we account for, and we can do that using this model, compliance or partial compliance. So, how people react to instruction, how much time does it take them to go to get into isolation and so on. So we did all of that and I believe that I'm in three and a half minutes <laughs> and this is our team and what we're doing right now. Well, yes. Very interesting and really important. Uh, maybe the COVID is over, but there might be other diseases <laughs> later on. There is always. There is always a disease. <laughs> okay. So I would like to finish this event um, with a person that was um, a key person in initiating um, the, the center, not only in Tel Aviv University, but also in Israel. So I'd like to invite Professor uh, Yoav Benjamini to say a few words before we close the event. Thank you, Yoav. Um, this is... With all these flags behind, I feel like a politician. Uh, the uh, VATAT, the, the Israeli uh, uh, Commission for Financing Higher Education, has decided to invest major funds in uh, three areas, uh, quantum, uh, digital health, and uh, data sciences. And that was wonderful news for us. And uh, I was chairing a committee, Professor Milov was joining me and others. And we, our, uh, our task was to set a strategy. And we decided uh, quite early that uh, actually investing the money in centers, data science uh, centers in university would be the best way uh, because there is a lot of interest. There is a lot of variety among the different areas of interest in the centers and we should give each one its own course, but to give it first of all to 
uh, institutions that have a right uh, level of readiness for this and uh, appropriate goals. And it is for me very nice to be a member on the committee and to see the results of this committee out there. We noticed that there are uh, people, data scientists who work in the core areas are involved in research outside the university. However, they are mostly interested in uh, working in Google, in IBM, Amazon, large companies, and more than half of the core researchers work outside the area. But when it got to social sciences, when it got to the government and so on, there were hardly none. So one of the issues that our committee decided, one of the uh, uh, ways was to set a special uh, area in the Israel Kernel uh, Lubit Lemada, Israel Science Foundation for social science research, uh, combining data science and social sciences. And I'm very glad to see that Google's uh, initiative is actually paving the way to the same ideas, uh, giving support to research in this way. And I hope that a project starting here will go on and continue with the larger uh, projects in the Kernel Meet. The idea of this project is to have both uh, support in the science of data science and in the social science. Finally, uh, the, the VATAT support is limited for three years and four years. And the idea was to let the center stand on their own legs. I'm glad that the Google was uh, the one offering the first, I don't know if a leg, but the first shoe. And I hope it will give more support for the center in future years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joab. Um, indeed, we would like the center to grow with the help of Google and others. Uh, so I'm now closing the event. Uh, I suppose we have some refreshment outside. Uh, thank you very much uh, here in the, in the audience and in the Zoom. And uh, hopefully you will, you now have to go to work. Get to work. Thank you. Thank you.